Hello, uh, it's Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo again. Uh, just to remind everyone, I'm a psychiatrist specializing in the treating of eating disorders, kind of hosting this uh, neuro series. We're up to episode five right now on the neurobiology of binge eating. Uh, so uh, let's get going on that. So without going into too much of the actual DSM-5 criteria, but just more of a review here, binge eating disorder is classified in the DSM-5 as an eating disorder. It's recurrent persistent episodes of binge eating associated with three or more of the following, those criteria listed there, eating more rapidly than normal, uh, eating until you're feeling uncomfortably fill, full, eating large amounts of food when you're not feeling hungry, uh, eating alone, uh, being embarrassed by how much you're eating, feeling disgusted with yourself, depressed, guilty uh, about any periods of overeating. What's interesting is people will often describe themselves as when I'm having a binge episode, I'm in a zone. I'm just not thinking about anything and I'm just consuming food without much thought to it. Um, it's uh, different from bulimia nervosa because bulimia nervosa has those compensatory mechanisms uh, doing things to kind of correct the eating and overeating binges that take place. So, however, binge eating is kind of like the first criteria of bulimia nervosa, which we'll get to in the next neuro series. So some of the neurobiology and some of the findings show things like in many different eating disorders, there's changes in brain volume loss, uh, different areas are losing connections, but there's this interesting finding uh, with uh, binge eating disorder, and that, that there seems to be increased cellular volume, volume in certain areas of the prefrontal cor cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, and the ventral striatum are the names of these regions that in this study they find have increased cellular volume. That kind of correlates to uh, the intensity of the binge eating uh, that is taking place. So uh, this direct correlation helps kind of de determine the severity of purging uh, that's associated with that gray matter abnormality in the frontal lobes. And it's thought to be related to dysfunctions of the reward system and self-regulation, which usually is a main uh, region of the brain and the frontal parts there that are involved in things like the uh, reward system. And it's common not only with eating disorders, but things like other types of addictions and compulsive behaviors. Now, in these frontal regions, one of the main neurotransmitters that's involved is dopamine. And in this study here, they've showed how increased levels of Dopamine actually also predicts the degree of binge eating severity. And, you know, these types of studies here are done with PET scans, and they take place in uh, several parts of the frontal uh, networking systems, uh, like the caudate, which we'll, maybe I'll mention that a little bit later. What they also have shown that there's these uh, reward networks that show when they're in their resting state, there's a, a hypoconnectivity, which really means they're just not communicating with each other as well as when people don't have binge eating disorder, the healthy controls. And this seems to show another signs of why there may be such an impairment with uh, reward processing and how that can kind of uh, potentiate the intensity of the eating disorder um, uh, in, in that reward system there, there, there's some regions that are important to kind of recognize as well. Um, we talked about the amygdala, which is, is something that's critical, and it mediates the um, pleasurable feelings one has when they are having uh, foods that may contain fat, salt, sugar. And there seems to be this dysregulation in the body's uh, endogenous opioid uh, chemistry, which means like uh, not that people are taking opioids, but our body makes chemicals that are kind of very natural and similar to other types of opiates. And there's certain receptors that are involved that can be dysregulated. And that correlates uh, to kind of regions that play a role in the pleasurable aspects of food intake. Again, especially those of, of things that are, have fats, sugars, and salts. So normally, opioids will block the um, intensity of 
excitement and everything, which decreases the desire to have these types of cravings for these types of foods. And at the same time, because it decreases the pleasurable experience of the foods, pr kind of promotes one to keep eating more and more and more to try to achieve that pleasurable uh, amount of activity. And with binge eating disorder, there's a, a lot of study being done on the um, hormonal effects of the body on, on binge eating. This was an experiment that was actually done with mice. And in this experiment, they kind of, you know, poor mice had their ovaries removed and everything, and they weren't allowed to kind of produce estrogen. And it caused a tremendous increase in binge eating activities. The mice just couldn't stop eating. So scientists then gave them kind of this protein that uh, de helped deliver estrogen to regions of the brain in the mice uh, that it couldn't receive because the ovaries were moved. And what they saw is there was a significant decrease in binge-like eating in, in, in the mice that had had the ovaries removed. So this type of connection with estrogens and as well as other hormones in how eating behavior patterns are driven is under a lot of investigation. There are many studies out there. And when we look at the brain, we kind of go back to, well, can are things actually organic in nature? Uh, this was an interesting study. It looked at different binge eating uh, disorders based on uh, the white matter tracks on the reward systems in different people who suffered with binge eating versus bulimia nervosa. And the uh, people who studied these uh, scans could look at it and they developed definite patterns that they could distinguish between somebody who was suffering from, let's say, binge eating versus bulimia nervosa. After they could identify what these specific unique findings were, they would take studies like this and they would give them to people who are trained to read and interpret these types of studies and kind of say, hey, if you look at this, tell us, does this person have binge eating or are they more somebody who suffers from bulimia nervosa? And it kind of showed that with uh, 78 to 80% a accuracy, they, uh, people could actually predict just by looking at pictures of the brains and white matter of what type of eating disorder someone was suffering from. So that was just your introduction, basically, to some of the interesting findings with uh, bulimia nervosa and the neurobiology and the neuroscience behind it. Uh, I probably could, you know, do a three-day slide point presentation on it, but I'm just trying to lay some foundation here. And we're going to move on next to neuro series six, which is the neurobiology of bulimia nervosa. And with bulimia nervosa, remember that first component of everything still involves the uh, that people engage in binge eating. Um, uh, it's just that they have things that they do to compensate for those behaviors. So a lot of the findings you just saw in, in the, the, this series on binge eating disorder are also are, are very similar findings of what you will find in the brain central nervous system of people who suffer from bulimia nervosa.